The Textual Confidence Collective rides again for four episodes for our second series. Only we didn't have enough microphones for us all to ride together for this first episode in this series because we had three very special, highly qualified guests for this one. You'll meet them in a minute. I'm recording a brief intro to this already very long video because this video jumps right into the deep end, and I think a short orientation will help you. It's time for the Textual Confidence Collective to tackle a question I get over and over again here on my channel. Shouldn't we reject all modern Bibles because they all come from Westcott and Hort, and weren't they untrustworthy? This was the argument I specifically recall hearing from my pastor when I was a teenager in a King James-only church. Westcott and Hort were occultists and apostates, I was told, and all modern Bibles traced to them, so we should all just use only the King James, I was told. Tim Berg is our resident Westcott and Hort expert, as you'll see in the coming four videos, so he will lead this first discussion with special guests Dr. Peter Gurry, a critical text proponent, and Drs. Abidan Shah and Maurice Robinson, who take a Byzantine priority position. And here's what they're going to discuss, though I warn you, it takes about 40 minutes, right at 40, of preliminaries before they really get into it. These are textual critics, after all, detail guys. Anyway, they will discuss whether the ideas of Westcott and Hort really control the current practice of New Testament textual criticism. In short, the answer is no. In long, the answer is, as it always is with textual criticism of any document, it's complicated. Some ideas championed by Westcott and Hort are still powerful among Christians who study the history of the Greek New Testament, but the field made progress before them, and it has continued to move since then, as you'll see. So it's just not as simple as saying, before Westcott and Hort came along, everybody trusted the Textus Receptus, and now everybody but King James readers takes Westcott and Hort's unbelieving perspective. And the fact is, they were not unbelievers. So in the three videos after this one, in our new series, we in the Textual Confidence Collective will take a hard look at what Westcott and Hort actually believed. We will do our best to share with you, in their own words, what they believed about the deity of Christ, the inspiration of Scripture, and other theological topics. We believe that these men are being horribly and maliciously slandered, even while we ourselves have our disagreements with both of them. Join me and Tim Berg, Peter Montoro, and Elijah Hickson, the Textual Confidence Collective. Listen to this and our next three episodes in order to get a careful, charitable, accurate view of the 19th century scholars Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort. Welcome to the Textual Confidence Collective. If you have watched any of our previous videos, you know that the Textual Con Confidence Collective is all about promoting and propagating confidence in the text of Scripture. We work to oppose to extreme views that we think are unhealthy views of the reliability of the Bible and of its transmission. On the one hand, textual skepticism, where people think that because the Bible has been copied so many times and miscopied so many times and misquoted maybe so many times, there no longer is an authoritative text. And we want to push against that and suggest that that's not a healthy view of the Bible. And on the other hand, there's another extreme that we call textual absolutism, which is the view that one particular form of the text, maybe a printed edition, maybe a translation, that that form is somehow above revision and correction. And we want to push against that. Well, at the Textual Confidence Collective, we've been taking up an argument that comes from some who defend the King James Bible, certainly not all of them, and I will say normally we have not addressed the real extreme wings of the elements of King James onlyism, uh, but we want to here for a few sessions because there's, there's an argument that is very common and popular that goes in four basic steps, not always promoted this way, but in four basic steps logically. First, that any time heretical or unholy hands touch a text, that text, that Bible text becomes tainted and can no longer be trusted. Secondly, that all modern Bible translations in some way or another are connected to or dependent upon the work of Hort and Westcott, two Anglican scholars that we're going to talk about later. And third, that Hort and Westcott were apostates with a whole long series of uncomfortable negative adjectives that are sometimes connected on there. And that therefore the conclusion is you should not use any modern Bible, but should just use the King James Bible. Well, when we think about that second premise, this idea that modern textual criticism today is essentially just Horton Westcott, or that modern Bible translations today are essentially just translations of the Horton Westcott text, there's actually a lot of complicated, sort of nuanced discussion that I think could take place there, and we could ask some questions about just how related modern-day New Testament textual criticism is to the work of Westcott and Hort. 
but we've decided to bring some expert scholars here to bring some diverse viewpoints to wrestle with those questions and maybe have some different ideas and different understandings of those questions. And we're gonna point towards them and let them tell us a little bit about themselves, their work in textual criticism, uh, maybe a little bit about where you have pastored or pastoral work that you've done. So I'm just gonna let you start here, Dr. Robinson, and tell us a little bit about yourself, your training, your work in textual criticism and your pastoral ministry. Okay, uh, to keep it brief, I started out as a reasoned eclectic when I was a student in college and I was called into ministry. I recognized the call and the pastor recognized the call. And as I prepared to go to seminary, I was reading up on textual criticism and I read books by Metzger, by Harold Greenlee and various others. And I basically became a practicing reasoned eclectic. My first Greek New Testament that I had was Barry's Interlinear. Mm. And it had variant readings down there, not according to manuscripts, but according to which editors preferred it. And my simple solution at that time, not knowing too much, was if a majority of editors wanted a different reading than was in the TR, that's what I followed. And as I learned more, then I went to the UBS first edition, Greek New Testament, and I continually was accepting whatever reading they said had an A degree of certainty, and maybe some with B degree, but I'd never touch a C or D. And I was, for all practical purposes, a practicing reason eclectic. And then when I was in seminary, I started studying advanced Greek, and one of the advanced Greek courses was textual criticism, and I talked with the professor that would teach it. He said, you know more about this subject than I do. So he sent me over to Duke, whereas I could then engage with Kenneth W. Clark, who at that time was retired, but he was the oldest living textual critic still practicing at that point. And I started studying with Clark for a period of about seven years, and Clark is the one that led me away from recent eclecticism by saying, you've only been reading the people from one side. Have you read the other side? And I said, what other side? Bergen, Scrivener, mm. Cook, uh, Salmon, various others from the 19th century. And I said, well, I'll read them. And then after I read them, he'd grill me on them. And he finally, got to the point where he was saying that he thinks they had a better case going than the reasoned eclectics, which is strange because Clark from 1933 onward had been himself a practiced reason, reasoned eclectic. But what happened was Clark in his later articles published in the 1960s primarily, he started taking a lot of jabs against the practice of reasoned eclecticism mm -hmm. without offering a solution. So the solution was, as he said, if he were 40 years younger, he would write a book on that and be pushing toward the Bergen and Scrivener position. Mm -hmm. And he told me, he said, you're young, maybe you can do it. <laughs> but that's what started me on the change. And I slowly changed, it was slow. I, he also had me reading things like articles from Bibliotheca Sacra by Zane Hodges and uh, various other people, Marchant King and a few other people that back in the 60s that, that they were. But uh, I never met any of those at that time. And finally, I got in touch with William Pierpont. He had been studying textual criticism since back in the early 1930s. He was much older than me. He was old, as old as my father and Pierpont had already come to a Byzantine text position in 1965. And I didn't get in touch with him until 1976, where I was working for a Bible publisher, and he wrote a letter to the Bible publisher offering his majority text notes mm -hmm. if the publisher wanted them. And the publisher then came to me and said, do you think these are any good? I looked at him and said, well, yeah. <laughs> so. I started reading those notes and part of the task I had working with Pierpont was verify them and make sure that they are still supported well because he worked 
only from von Soden at the time. Mm. So I compared with other editions, Tischendorf and Tregellis and others that talked about what the Byzantine reading would be. We didn't call it Byzantine then, we just called it majority text. Mm. And going through all this, I slowly came to a Byzantine text position. And by 1976, I was convinced uh, after going through all this, and Pierpont and I then started doing work. We had the majority text notes published in the interlinear Bible that had come out back in the late 70s. And by uh, 79, that's when it was published. And it was only in the notes. It showed the variants from the TR that would be the Byzantine readings. But that was actually the first Byzantine text edition, mm -hmm. if you want to take it that way. Mm -hmm. And then we worked from there, fine tuning things a lot more. and developing more in the areas of theory, and that worked on from about 1980 until 1991, and then we published the first edition of the Byzantine text, which was limited. Desktop publishing at that time was primitive. Right. We did it on Word 2. You have to think way, way back for this. Microsoft Word 2 couldn't do any breathings or accents. Oh, wow. Had to use the symbol font. Wow. which had no punctuation, but we printed that first edition with a thousand copies in limited edition. That was it, and we sold those out fairly quickly. And then we kept working in fine tuning until another fellow approached us, Ken Chilton, and he offered to do a well typeset version with breathings, accents, punctuation, because he had the material to do true typesetting with and if we were willing to do it, he would do it, and we would copyright it, release it into public domain after that, and make no profit on it whatsoever, sell it at cost. Mm. And he created the Byzantine Text Form 2005 edition, mm. and that was our first edition. And then as time passed, uh, Jeffrey Dodson joined in with the work we did after Pierpont died. Pierpont died in 2003. He was 86 at that time, and J Dodson joined in, and he was the one that did further text formatting, and he produced the reader's edition that we had that came out in 2010, and it was slightly tweaked and adapted up to 2015, and then we had a new edition come out, which is this one right here. Okay. Uh, that was the 2018 edition, and that's the current edition that's out there. It's a paper-bound one, and if you use it too heavily, it'll fall apart. But uh, <laughs> we're still looking toward a, another hardback Smithsonian edition, and uh, a fellow Dwayne Green, you know uh -huh. him, uh, he's, he's got a group going that's trying to work on getting the new edition hardbound Smithsonian, and it would be published in conjunction with also Adam Boyd's translation okay. of the Byzantine text. And Adam Boyd, of course, is, works with SIL, and he is a good translator, yeah. and try to get both volumes coming out at about the same time, and both hardbacks my own. That is exciting. I did not realize it was in the works. I knew that this was, to my knowledge, the newest edition, but I didn't know you were working that on that. Is, that is the current one. but. I don't know how long it'll take. Of course, the issue for them is finances, mm -hmm. and sure. we'll see what happens. Well, that's very exciting, and we are honored that you're joining us here. We've benefited uh, from your work, and I know the others here have benefited from your work, and we are honored and grateful for your presence. Well, Peter Gurry, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background in net textual criticism, and your pastoral work? Sure. So I uh, teach New Testament at Phoenix Seminary, and I also co-direct the Texan Canon Institute there where our mission is to illuminate the history of the Bible. So we work a lot with um, this. We, we spend a lot of time thinking about this question of how we got the Bible. My own specialty is in the textual history of the New Testament. So I did my undergraduate degree at Moody Bible Institute, and that's where I really started to get interested in manuscripts. And then went from there to work with Dan Wallace at Dallas Theological Seminary and went on several trips with him while I was a student to libraries throughout Europe and got to see manuscripts in person for the first time. That, that really solidified my interested interest in textual criticism. And from there, I went to Cambridge University and wrote a dissertation on textual criticism. So now I teach New Testament and uh, live and work in Phoenix. Uh, I'm a pastor at my church there in Phoenix. So teach a lot and do pastoral ministry on the side. 
guess you'd say. Yeah, wonderful. That is beautiful. We have a passion to connect academic work to the people that are in the pew. So having a group of people that have served in textual criticism at the academic level and also have a passion to pastor and to bring that to people who maybe don't have an easy bridge to that knowledge, we're super grateful for that and we love that. We are honored that you're here, Peter. Abedon, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in textual criticism and pastoral work? Sure. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, well, it was in 1996 when I came to Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and um, uh, I was working at the time and trying to find the best classes so I can get off in time to go to work and come back and all that. And I wanted to take elementary Greek first thing in the morning and then go off to work. Mm. And it was all closed. <clears throat> there was no nothing available, and the ones that were available were in the middle of the day. It was just a rough situation. So I was really discouraged and I was walking back to my car and I ran into Dr. Robinson, who I had met at the uh, orientation. And uh, he said, well, how's everything going? I said, uh, not, not too good, because I can't take you. <laughs> and he, and he said, why do you want to take me? Is it because you're the first in the morning and it'll work great for my schedule? But he said, well, come with me. And we, he went to the registrar and uh, told them to open the classes and, and take me in. <laughs> and so from there, I didn't realize what was happening. My whole life was being set in motion mm -hmm. because um, <clears throat> I began elementary Greek and didn't realize I was getting to study under a textual critic. I didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> this, is, this is 1996. And I, I'm sitting there listening about Metzger and Holland and Kilpatrick and Elliot. And I'm like, who are these people and what, what have they done? <laughs> And uh, so anyways, that was my introduction. And and from there on, I mean, I just was hooked and I would spend time just sitting in his office talking to him and listening to him and uh, going on trips like ETS or the regional ETS. Mm -hmm. And then I, I've been pastoring since 1998 and the same church, only church. Mm -hmm. And um, I have leaned more towards the ministry side of things. Sure. Uh, but my heart has always been in textual criticism, and I was able to finish my PhD work with him, mm -hmm. with Dr. Robinson, in 2019, and uh, I'm still learning a lot. Well, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. We're honored that you're here, and I'm excited to have three voices that not only have a love for textual criticism and Bible translation, uh, but also just a love for the church and defending the truth in the church and pointing people in a faithful direction when it comes to Bible translation. So what I want to do now, I want to ask a couple of questions of each of you kind of individually uh, that we can keep somewhat brief, and then we're going to jump into kind of a big panel discussion. Um, so, Dr. Robinson, uh, obviously your work on the uh, PA is widely respected today as is the Byzantine text form that you've introduced to us. Um, but give us just, you gave us a little bit earlier of kind of what brought you to Byzantine priority. If you had to summarize what Byzantine priority is for maybe someone that's just hearing this for the first time, they don't know that there's different Bible texts, they don't know there's different approaches to textual criticism, or maybe they're confused and think that the TR is the same as the Byzantine text. Give us a summary of Byzantine priority. That's a loaded question. It's going to take a while. Sure. What is the Byzantine priority? It's the name that Pierpont and I made up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, because the name that was being used before was majority text. Right. But as Gordon Fee had complained, mm -hmm. majority text means all you're doing is counting noses. Mm -hmm. And, well, we weren't doing that. Right. The truth is, in most variant units, where there is textual variation, the majority of manuscripts tends to be one way or the other. That's why it was called majority text. But in certain places, the majority splits. Right. In some places, we even actually in our edition favor a text that, a reading that has less than a actual numerical majority. Right. Not often, but it does happen, and especially in Revelation it mm -hmm. happens, because there the text is a little more shaky because there are fewer manuscripts than anywhere else. Right. And more division between them. Yeah, but uh, the majority text was just not the right label. So we said, well, the majority text is the Byzantine text, but we want to s add the word priority in there because what we were trying to show was that the Byzantine text, in our view of the history of transmission, would have existed prior to the development of the other texts, and depending on how anyone wants to call them, text types, clusters, or whatever, mm -hmm. whether they are termed 
Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, or Alexandrian, or Caesarean, or Western, that they would be deviations that occurred historically in time from the pre-existing Byzantine text. So Byzantine priority means the Byzantine, in our view, was the one that was considered the text from which the other text types or clusters derived over time. Okay. Well, um, I appreciate that summary. Thank you for kind of breaking it down to us really simply. Let me ask you this question. A lot of people who follow this channel will have heard the names Bergen and Scrivener um, and be maybe somewhat familiar with their work. Maybe they've read them, maybe they've only heard about them or seen them cited. How would your Byzantine priority position and method and approach to the text compare to or contrast from that of Bergen and Scrivener? We'd be close in terms of the resultant text. The difference is that Bergen would place a lot of weight on uh, ecclesiastical tradition because he was a high church Anglican. Mm -hmm. And he would elevate not only tradition, but especially tradition as expressed through the church fathers. And if the Byzantine text were solid, the fathers would not override that and they'd be used for a confirmatory purpose. Right. But if the Byzantine at any point the manuscripts were divided, usually for him he would allow the fathers to help tip the balance one way or the other. So he had an overemphasis on the fathers, mm -hmm. which was probably about as equal as his emphasis on other versions, but only when the Byzantine text was split. Okay. Scrivener, on the other hand, was n not that close as Bergen, but he was still much closer to the Byzantine position than he would be to the eclectic position or the Westcott Hort position. Right. And Scrivener had a interesting way of putting things. You read a lot of his material and it sounds like he's defending the Byzantine text fully, but he's not. Right. There there are readings where he will reject the Byzantine text based on the agreement of the five oldest unsealed manuscripts, the ones written in capital letters. Mm -hmm. And he qualifies it, he says, but you'd never hardly ever find all five of them agreeing at any one time, but he still will deviate from the Byzantine text. If you've got usually three or four of them deviate, he often will go with that reading as opposed to the Byzantine. So he is more in between, but again, the difference between Bergen, Scrivener, and the modern eclecticism is they really were not dealing that much with internal evidence. They were right. dealing strictly with external as the primary determiner. And that's really what Westcott Hort themselves were doing. Hmm. It was mostly external evidence. And they are externalists, and so is the Byzantine priority position. But we actually listen to the demand by Gordon Fee that if we want to defend the Byzantine text, not to do it just on eclectic principles, uh, or any other principles, external evidence, or we've got to go to the internal evidence and show a reason why from internal evidence a Byzantine reading should be preferred. And Fee said it needs to be done throughout the entire New Testament, variant by variant by variant, mm -hmm. which is something that the reason eclectics themselves have never done. <laughs> but Fee did throw out that challenge, and it's a valid challenge. That's why we think that a textual commentary needs to be done, of which I've already written about 300 pages of a textual commentary that deals with the readings in the current critical text, the Nessel Island text, that have anywhere from one manuscript to three manuscripts in support. That doesn't sound like much, but I've got 300 pages that defending is, the readings in that category. So. That is exciting, and I hope that project presses forward and gets done. I think that would be super value, it'll be, uh, valuable it'll be to the It'll be finished in about a 50-year period. <laughs> well, you need to enlist some help. Get some guys to jump on board and help you with that, because <laughs> uh, I think that would be a valuable defense of that particular tradition and a valuable collection of evidence that sometimes mm -hmm. maybe doesn't get uh, considered or assessed. Let me ask you one more question kind of along those veins. Um, you wrote a paper, I think some time ago, called Crossing the Boundaries of New Testament Textual right. Criticism, kind of wrestling with Bergen and Scrivener, and I think in response to some things that Dan Wallace had written. Right. Maybe tell us a little bit about that paper, what it was, and well, where it pointed. It's a paper. If I'm I, not opening up a wound. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not a wound. It's a paper that I would have never intended to write on my own. Okay. Explain to us what you mean by not on your own. Uh, because it was a response to an article that Dan Wallace wrote 
critiquing the uh, majority text position that was published in New Testament studies. And he made the claim in the article that Scrivener was much closer to the critical text than to Bergen. Mm. And actually, you've got a letter from Scrivener, um, or I don't remember who he wrote it to, but he clearly stated, I am much closer to, I'm midway between Westcott Hort and Bergen, but I'm much closer to Bergen mm. than to Westcott and Hort, which totally contradicted the claims that uh, Dan Wallace was making. Okay. And I said, you know, this needs to be responded to and published. And so I wrote the article on that and I sent it to New Testament studies and they rejected it. <laughs> oh, I didn't uh, know that. <laughs> the, the reason they rejected it, the editor, I, I could tell you his name, I suppose, but I won't. But the editor said, you could have solved the whole problem just by making that one quote from Scrivener's letter. <laughs> And I said, yeah, but that's not an article that's going to get published either. <laughs> It'd be a so, short one. <laughs> so anyway, I ended up uh, having it published in the online TC journal. Mm -hmm. So uh, and they accepted it. I don't know who the peer reviewers were, but they didn't see the problem with it. So it's been published. And basically, I gave a lot more information than just that one quote oh, from yeah. Scrivener. I showed in many cases where Scrivener in fact, was going with the Byzantine as opposed mm -hmm. to the critical text. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for summarizing that. And I encourage the article to others who are maybe wrestling with, does Scrivener hold my position? Does he defend the TR? Is he identical to Bergen? Or should he be placed in an eclectic camp? I think it's a very helpful article, mm -hmm. and I'm grateful uh, for your work there. Let me ask you a few questions, Peter. Um, you've done a bunch of work, uh, obviously, on B.F. Westcott. You, I think, named a child after Westcott. Is that correct? <laughs> this is true. This is true, yeah. So there's obviously there's some, some appreciation there. Tell us a little bit about Westcott from your work and your work on his uh, published New Testament and why you hold him in high regard. Sure. So, um, you know, Westcott, uh, Brooke Foss Westcott was famous in his own day for <clears throat> his scholarship. He was a professor at Cambridge, hold, held a chair there. Um, and after that then went and was the Bishop of Durham. And so he was both a highly regarded scholar in his day and also a highly regarded churchman. So he had both of those two things. He was also prolific, and that's one of the differences between him and his counterpart, Hort, that Hort published very little in his own lifetime, whereas Westcott, most of his books went into multiple editions during his own lifetime. So uh, Westcott did not have the perfectionism that Hort had <laughs> in the same way. He was willing to send things to the publisher and get them published. The Westcott. curse of perfectionism. Yes, Hort was always, <laughs> there was more to do. There was always more to do for Hort. So he never was really willing to pull the trigger. So I think one of the things that drew me to Westcott, of course, was uh, that combination of very highly regarded scholar, very good textual critic, uh, good historian, good commentator on the New Testament, but also... Uh, you know, a real churchman really cared about the church, and for him it was never merely academics. Mm -hmm. He was never just studying history right. for the sake of history. He's never merely talking about the past, but he was also interested um, in <clears throat> what the New Testament itself is interested in, which is Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, you know, it's hard. I mean, when you're a student at Cambridge, it's hard not to admire Westcott. Right. And I just thought it was a good name. So, and we had two daughters first, so I couldn't use the name. For oh, them. you could have. You could have just been bold. I could. Now, people do sometimes ask me, "Why don't I name my other son Hort?" And I feel like that's the question that answers itself. That's right. Um, <laughs> so, anyways, so yeah, I've always really admired him. Of course, I'm you know a text critic, so right. um, I've admired him for that for that work. So, you also wrote an article not too long ago that became a chapter um, on the creation of the Hort and Westcott text, or the Westcott and Hort text, yeah. um, and maybe some of even the details personally that went between them and the letters. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that, the creation sure. of that text, and if you want to, a little bit about how it connected to the 1881 uh, English Revised uh, Version. Version. Okay, so first things first. Things first. They would not have been happy with you calling it the Hort and Westcott Yeah, text. I realized right after I said that that I made okay. a boo-boo. I caught, you caught yourself. <laughs> uh, we actually have letters between them where they discuss this, uh, and that's basically what my article is about, is it's a look at the letters that we have between them. They worked on this for nearly 30 years, and originally they thought it would not take them very long. Uh, they vastly underestimated the, the amount of work sure. <laughs> involved. But uh, in the course of their working on this together, there were, there were points at which they lived together in Cambridge, not together, but in the same city in Cambridge. So they were able to discuss it in person, but then other parts where they lived in different places. And so they would write to each other. And we have uh, a number of these letters between them. So I have been working on those letters over, the, over a number of years. You're going to publish a collection of them. I hope to. Yep, so I've been working on them since I was a student at Cambridge. 
And basically the article was an attempt to pull the curtain back and see what we can learn about how they worked together on this edition over so many years. And um, so, for example, one of the things we learned from their letters is that Hort, who had been a student of Westcott, was adamant that Westcott being the older of the two and being the professor of him, his professor, uh, his name should be first. So, and they actually wanted it to be uh, abbreviated as WH. They thought through even that level of, hmm. <laughs> of the title. Uh, and that's one of the things that I appreciate most in working through their letters is that they were both extremely, or even, even more so, but they were both very careful with the details. Um, I have letters where up until the last minute they are, you know, one of the things that they did was when they thought the New Testament writers were quoting from the Old Testament, they put it in capital letters, okay, in a different font. And we have places where they are, where, where Westcott, for example, in, in Hebrews, which was one of his specialties, is saying, we also need to capitalize this word. <laughs> so even by the end, they're still <laughs> going back and forth on individual words wow. and what needs to be capitalized. They wrote about punctuation. They wrote about uh, what they were going to title the books, of course. For example, if you look in the table of contents to an original edition, you will note very carefully that there is one gospel in their edition, one gospel according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to for each one, because they were adamant that there was one gospel, but told in four forms. So they were careful to lay it out that way in the, in the table of contents itself. Uh, there's a letter from Hort where he explains to the publisher what he wants the title to be, and then even what he wants it to be abbreviated as on the spine of the book. Tell us a little about so, maybe even the specific yeah. choice they made there and what it suggests about yeah, their text. Yeah, okay, so I have argued, and I've not convinced everybody, but I have argued You convinced that, me, that's why I want to okay. hear it again. <laughs> uh, I have argued that when their title uses the term original, um, they are not thinking the title primarily of the original text so much as they mean in the original language. Mm -hmm. And I think that's reflected in the title on the spine, which most people do not think about, but Hort did. And the way they abbreviated the title on the spine, I think, is an indication that their word original primarily in their mind meant original language, Greek, as opposed to they were familiar with the New Testament in other languages like Latin, right. of course, Syriac, and others. Um, so I think that's the primary indication. Now, of course, in the introduction, they explain why, you know, that they're also trying to recover the original text right. in Greek. So it's not as if we should pit these two against each other. Sure. But I do think the primary reference of the word original is to the language more than the text itself. Um, so, yeah. Well, I think you convinced me. Maybe not everybody, <laughs> but when, when I read it, you definitely Done. convinced me. Well, it was a helpful prayer. point. <laughs> uh, it's an unusual author who decides exactly how the words on Indeed. the spine should read Indeed. of a book that will be published. Or it was very particular. <laughs> well, let me ask you another uh, few questions there. Um, so you've also done a lot of work on the coherence-based genealogical method. Mm -hmm. I know that's a super complex topic uh, with lots of sort of moving parts. Yeah. But if you were able to kind of summarize that for us briefly, uh, as briefly as possible. I cannot do that. Okay, okay you cannot. <laughs> as briefly as possible, yes. That yeah, would be. give us a little bit yeah. about what that is, and then sure. maybe specifically how impacted that might be by the work of, say, Westcott and Hort. Okay, so the first thing to say is Westcott and Hort have nothing to do with the CBGM. You cannot blame them for that. I'm sorry. Um, but the, the coherence-based genealogical method is a method that uses computers to help editors uh, do a couple things. One, it helps them compare uh, the text of manuscripts at every point of variation, and then... Uh, produce a very uh, precise statistical agreement. So any two manuscripts that are included in the edition that the CBGM is based on, you can compare those two manuscripts and immediately this, the computer can tell you what percentage of agreement do they have with each other, right? right. Which is really amazing because we've not had that level of detail right. in the past. Um, and so you can do that for any two manuscripts. And one of the things you discover is that even a manuscript that is considered purely Byzantine, let's call it, uh, still agrees with the manuscript like Codex Sinaiticus at upwards of 80% of places where wow. there are variation in the, in the, in, in the text. So <clears throat> we often tend to think of the Byzantine text as like the polar opposite of, say, what's in Sinaiticus or Vaticanus. And <clears throat> there may be a sense in which that's fair to say they're polar opposites. But if they are polar opposites, the poles are not that far apart, mm. actually. Oh, that's good. <laughs> they that's agree good. substantially. And we tend to focus on the differences because that's what gets people's attention. Right. But actually, they they agree far, 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 far more often than they disagree. Right. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, so what what else to do? So it can do that. It can tell you how much any two manuscripts agree with each other statistically. Then once the editors start making their decisions at thousands of places of variation, the computer keeps track of each manuscript that has each reading and remembers how the editors related the readings to each other. And then over time, across thousands of variations, the computer can help feed that information back to the editor and remind the editor that, hey, 
over thousands of decisions, you tended to think that this manuscript had the prior reading X number of times, and this other one had the later reading X number of times. In other words, the computer can start to tell you which manuscripts you as the editor think are actually the best ones. And that, that helps keep you accountable, mm. basically, to your own mm. method as you go. Because one of the things that's very hard to do as a human being is to keep thousands and thousands of data points in your mind all at the same time. You can't do that. But it's right. very easy for the computer to do. It can easily remember what decisions you made a thousand decisions ago and what manuscripts were involved and how you said they related at that particular point of variation. And then it can, it can then um, aggregate those thousands of decisions and feed that information back to you and suggest relationships of witnesses to each other. So that is a very short version. And very simplified version, yes. uh, but helps hopefully people that are the digging The bottom there. line, though, is that it's an attempt to, to use the, the power of computers to help us um, study the manuscript relations and then our own... Um, our own ways of thinking those manuscripts should relate to each other. Right. Not at all replacing the human, human nope. element by any means, nope. but human, aiding human the interpretation. Human actually becomes more important in right. some ways, I would suggest. Partly because, um, like, in Maurice's case, for example, when he, did, when he edited his edition, I'm going to guess that he had far fewer decisions to make than the editors who used the CBGM. Because, partly because of his method, but also partly because he could just assume a lot of decisions already. They don't. They have th in, in the Catholic letters, there are three, over 3,000 places where they made decisions. And I don't think Maurice made that many decisions. Wouldn't have to. Yeah, he wouldn't have to. <laughs> right. right. So, um, so they have a, there's a lot more data behind it. And again, it's really hard for the human brain to keep all that data in, right. in your head at one time. Thank you. That's a really helpful summary of a, I know, a super complex topic <laughs> complex. Um, and helps us, you know, and helps our viewers yeah. be maybe a little bit abreast of some of what's going on right now in New Testament textual criticism um, and the tools that are being used today. So let me point now to Abaddon just a little bit. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your dissertation because I, I have to confess I haven't read the whole thing. I'm, you know, making my way into the New Testament textual critical field and trying to read stuff as it comes, but I haven't got to it. But I will just to kind of frame this. Uh, as we argue against what we call textual skepticism, it seems to me from what I have read of your dissertation that you're also pointing against Ehrman and some of those that have suggested a shifting goalpost in New Testament textual criticism. Tell us a little bit about that shifting goalpost and what impact it can have on our view of biblical authority. Oh, absolutely. So... In the past 30, 40 years, there has been a shift, and it, it became really prominent with the coming of R. Herman's uh, Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And so when I was first exposed to that, it, it, I didn't know what was happening and what, what these uh, proto-Orthodox scribes had done to the text. And so this is about the same time that I'm taking Dr. Robinson's class. And um, so, you know, when you're starting out, seminary student you you want to please the professor so we're like <laughs> he, he he says byzantine a lot we're all byzantine we're all byzantine <laughs> and um and then he says no i want you to go and read westcott and hold mm. and and uh, do you remember saying that to us <laughs> said knowledge of documents <laughs> proceeds final judgments upon reading go read it and, and right. i started and i gave up in the first 10 minutes i said <laughs> i have no idea what they're talking about <laughs> And I started reading again. I gave up again because, I mean, face it, it's tough to, to get yes. through that. It's dense. And it took me a good year before I finally got through it. And I said, I, I, I still don't know, but I'm getting it. And, and so, but anyways, I kind of deviate from that topic. But that was my introduction to textual criticism at the same time. Uh, this book is out by uh, Professor UNC Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then in time... I realized how it was uh, challenging inerrancy, mm. how inerrancy is important as a corollary of inspiration. Yeah. And so, um, so simultaneously these things are happening. I'm learning about textual criticism and at the same time seeing that this, this book is, is a big threat to what we believe about uh, the text of the New Testament. And so I, we made a proposal that I would do my dissertation on that and call it a postmodern deconstruction of the New Testament mm. text, and it didn't fly uh, because uh, <laughs> because they can understand how what postmodernism with uh, uh, Derrida and and all those guys had to do with um, with Bart Ehrman. Right, that has nothing to do with that. But we were not talking about postmodernism as literature. We we're talking right. about it as a philosophy. Mm. 
that how when you become skeptical about the text, uh, that any text or no text at all uh, is the goal of textual criticism, then, then it definitely affects how we see scripture, the authority of scripture. Hmm. And so that is my dissertation. And I, of course, I look at several others, David Parker, mm-hmm. uh, Eldon Abb, J.K. Elliott. also look at CBGM, uh, but um, uh, then I draw my conclusion on that. That's excellent. Thank you so much for summarizing that. that that's right in line with what we want to do. Right. We want to encourage textual confidence, confidence in the text of Scripture, of and oppose that kind of what we call, you wouldn't use these terms, maybe, but what we call textual skepticism. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Let me ask you this, just kind of along those lines, as you've looked at uh, different editors and how they've done that, would you see uh, that modern shifting of the goalpost in something like Ehrman as distinctly different from what Horton Westcott were doing in their approach to the text and the goal of textual criticism? No, I, I think those are two different issues we're talking about there. I mean, my I cut my teeth on Westcott and Hort, mm-hmm. to be very honest. I mean, that's where I learned the importance of external evidence and how that impacts textual criticism. So that's that's and and, and I wouldn't say they were necessarily challenging the uh, causing suspicion or, mm-hmm. or, or those kind of things. Sure. When you read uh, Ehrman's book and of course misquoting Jesus right, it's, right. it's on a lay level and a popular one that everybody reads right it, it seems like on one hand he gives you all the information whether in the footnotes or in the main text but then you still walk away going wow we don't have the Bible we mm. will never have the Bible right the Bible is hopelessly corrupted and it's over and I don't know how he does that, but it does. Because he doesn't come out and say that, but right. definitely lets the reader conclude that. Exactly, yeah. and, and I see something very different with West Carolina Court. Okay, well, thank you. That's, that's a very helpful summary, and I appreciate you all kind of speaking into an area that we've just sort of picked of all your vast works. But what I'd like to do now is maybe open up kind of some back and forth discussion to wrestle with the, as we're taking this big four-part argument for the King James, that second premise being modern textual criticism is really just Horton Westcott. Modern Bibles are really just translated from Horton Westcott. Uh, But let me frame that in what might be a little bit more of an academic framework, and I haven't done near the reading that you guys have in this field, but my understanding is that in the 60s and the 70s, there was talk from Kurt Aland and Eldon Epp about an interlude, a 20th century interlude in New Testament textual criticism, and these accusations flew back and forth that maybe in some ways textual criticism has really never got beyond Horton Westcott, and I'm just curious to hear you guys' different perspectives uh, as you step into really two aspects of that question, how distinct is modern day textual criticism and it's seen from the, the theory and method of Horton Westcott? And then how distinct is the text, the standard text in New Testament textual criticism today from the text, from the, the text of Westcott and Horton? I keep saying it wrong and I apologize. Apologize to Westcott and You've corrected me. <laughs> uh, but I, I just want to yeah. hear some discussion from you guys. I assume you might have some different perspectives as you answer those two questions. Uh, so let's just take the first the, the theory and history of the text that Westcott and Hort came up with. How prevalent is that today? How accepted is it today? How impactful is it? Uh, wh- what do the scholars say? I'll start and then Maurice can correct me. Um, I think it, it depends what you mean by their theory. If you mean, um, say, their view that we should know individual manuscripts and their proclivities before we make decisions about readings, I don't know anybody today who disagrees with that, mm. that knowing manuscripts is important, right? right? Nobody would argue against that principle. That's probably the single most quoted line in text critical writing. Right. I've, sure, I've quoted it three or four times. I'll probably quote it many more times before I retire because it's true and it's right. re- a really important principle that you should know manuscripts before you start making judgments about readings. Um, I think also the other thing I'd say is something that's, that's carried over is their concern for basing your method on an understanding of the history of the text. So like Maurice can maybe disagree, but I don't think he will. Uh, he would agree wholeheartedly with that, that your method should be grounded in an understanding of the history of the text development, right? Those two have to go hand in hand. Where I think people do not follow them anymore is on their theory of the text historical development. So Tell even us what the collectors today would not agree with Westcott and Hort, for example, that the Byzantine text is a fourth century recension. Uh, very few, if any, New Testament text critics would agree with that. And if you want the standard work critiquing that view is by Klaus Wachtel. It's not well known sometimes by, well, okay, let's say in debates about the King James Bible because it's written in German. Right. Okay? Hasn't been translated into English. 
but <clears throat> his argument was very clear that Westcott and Hort were very wrong to think that the, the Byzantine text is the result of a fourth century recension, which reopens the question of, well, then what is it? Do you see? Right. And people can now answer that question in different ways, and my colleague would answer it differently from me and from Klaus Vachtel. But the point is, nobody is taking Westcott and Hort's particular history of the New Testament text as their starting point. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What they are still taking, though, I think, is this idea, the, 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 the broader idea that you do need to have a theory of the text history in order to then practice textual criticism. Okay. Would you agree, Maurice? I'll agree to most of that. All right. uh, the thing is, Westcott Hort's original theory was not just based on that Byzantine revision to create the Byzantine text in the fourth century by a formal recensional process, but they also add to their theory their concept of what they tr treated as genealogical method, mm. which is basically uh, erroneous because they didn't really do any genealogical. They only created an artificial stemma that they used, said if it were this way, then this is what would happen. And then they tried to say, well, now that's a conclusion and we'll determine our text based on this genealogical method that didn't exist. And Colwell, strongly refuted that with his article on genealogical method, its limitations, and uh, that part of their theory is not accepted either. So you've okay. got that extra in there. The difference is still from their external evidence basis, which is what they are basing it on, and it is based on their interpretation of what knowledge of documents means, sure. they worked in a method that would have been at the best circular, okay. at, at least what they say. We don't know because they don't give us the data, but they said first you look at manuscripts and you look at the readings that are in the manuscripts. This is trying to do the knowledge of documents. Mm -hmm. And then you determine which readings in a manuscript subjectively in their opinion are the best. And then after you get around that, then you come around to say, well, which manuscripts have the greater percentage of best readings? And then they are declared to be the best manuscripts. Mm -hmm. Then you go back around the circle again and say, now that these are the best manuscripts, when they agree, now they're the ones that we will follow. And mm -hmm. that's sort of how the method went. So it, right. it was a circular, or you might even say it was a spiral, but I think it was more <laughs> circular. But uh, that's how they determine the text. And right. in reality for Westcott and Hort, despite everything else they said about genealogy and Byzantine recension in the fourth century and all that, it still came down. They really had a very strong favoritism for Olive and B, Sinaiticus right. and Vaticanus. And their position was really, if they agreed, that was basically the text. If right. they the disagreed, text. then they would have to choose one or the other. But it, they were heavily on that side and they would throw in other manuscripts that tended to share these, uh, if you want to call them Alexandrian readings, Westcott and Hort called them neutral, right. but if you had manuscripts like L come in and it sided with B against Aleph, then they would go with the B and L combination, and they do this with various combinations to determine their text, but in essence, most of their text is related to Aleph and B, where both are extant. Now, you have problems because B ends in the middle of Hebrews, but uh, after that, they would move to Codex Alexandrinus, which is A, and then they'd use that for the remainder of the New Testament and Revelation as usually their touchstones. Mm -hmm. uh, again, modern textual critics don't go with that procedure to determine the text. Right. They are reasoned eclectics. They are using a combination of external evidence and internal criteria. And Westcott and Hort didn't even like external internal criteria. They said it's too subjective. And they say that right in their introduction. Uh, they really are externalists. And the modern eclectics probably are equal balance or even more so toward internal mm -hmm. than they are toward the external data. So the methodology today is quite different from Westcott and Hort. The issue that is raised by various complaints is, well, is our text today still almost the same as Westcott and Hort? And the answer is yes. There may be out of 
there are in the New Testament 17,000 something words, maybe about 500 words now are different from what was in Westcott and Hort. Okay. Can you That's, give a stat on that? Yeah, we want the numbers. There so are, if you go to Aland and Aland, Kurt and Barbara Aland's. A little project. older, but still careful older study. Older. So they compare, Nes uh, they compare Westcott and Hort's text to the Nestle 25th edition. We're now in the 28th, so keep that in right. mind. But when they were writing their book, they compared it to the 25th edition, and they say there are a total of 558 differences between the Nestle 28, mm -hmm. or sorry, Nestle 25 and Westcott and Hort. Right. So they then go on to say, although 555 differences, or they say 555 differences is by no means a negligible amount. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah. you may disagree with them on whether that's negligible or not. Right. But the point is to say, uh, they are trying to make the case that you can't pigeonhole the Nestle Elan text as just a reprint of Westcott yeah. Hort. It's right? not just a reprint, but it is still, if you took that into percentages, you're still at around 98% identical right. as far yeah. as the resultant text. Yeah. But again, sure. the methodology reaching these positions are totally different. Right. Uh, the, different. It's just like the differences between the Robinson Pierpont Byzantine text and Hodges Farstad. Mm -hmm. We have two totally different methodologies, but we come into a text that's probably about 99.8% identical. Right. And totally different methodologies or slightly different methodologies? <laughs> <laughs> or, is that, or is that a sensitive question we, to ask? No, we could go into a whole discussion of Hodges and Farstad's methodology, but uh, they went to a, a stomatic approach. Right. And Counting noses. That's where they could do stomatics in the uh, Pericope Adulteri and in Revelation. And elsewhere, they were using von Soden strictly. Mm. They weren't looking at anything else right. to correct errors in von Soden. And the trouble was that when the Byzantine was divided in von Soden, they would use the I group of von Soden, which is what today would be considered uh, or called the Western and the Caesarean groups. Mm -hmm. And they would use that to tilt the balance. And the Byzantine priority position of Robinson Pierpont would be, no, we don't touch that I group to make the final decision. We're making the decision from within the Byzantine text, and if it's split, we do use internal evidence right. as our primary decider if the evidence is almost equally divided. Okay. That's, that's helpful. And so let's maybe use that even to shift now from, as we've talked about, that similarity of... Uh, approach maybe, even though distinctly different principles, the text itself seems similar. Uh, I want to hear different perspectives from each of you. Why is the modern text, how similar is the modern text to theirs as you've raised some numbers now, and why? Why is the text similar? Is it because of a direct influence of Horton Westcott? Is it something before them, something after them? Where does that come from? And maybe, Peter, we can start with you and then bounce it around. Sure. So, I, you know, maybe I can back up a little bit and just say something about even the comparison itself. Now, it has been made many, many times. People often compare, when, when new editions come out, it's, it's not been uncommon in the history of the last 100 plus years for editors to compare their text with Westcott and Hort. But I think it's a little bit on, I mean, there are reasons why there has been, their edition became such a touchstone, but it's not as if they are somehow out on a limb at their own time. If you were to compare their edition to Tregellis's mm -hmm. or Tischendorf's, those three editions would also agree with each other much more than any of those three would agree with, say, a Byzantine text or right. a TR, do you see? Mm -hmm. So they're not sort of out on a limb and they single-handedly change everybody's mind. It's more that they are part of a much larger group of, uh, you know, part of a larger group of scholars, maybe, maybe large when we're talking about text criticism, probably not <laughs> right. an appropriate word, but <laughs> they're part of a group The small of, nerd club. <laughs> they're part of a small group of scholars, but who are very, you know, very knowledgeable and well-regarded, who are all together moving away from the Texas Receptus at the same time and also at that same time, now Tregellis is a little bit different because of the time, but mm -hmm. using Sinaiticus for the first time to right. do that. Now remember, this is all before the discovery of the papyri. Mm -hmm. So once the papyri come along, if all the papyri that were discovered were all Byzant purely Byzantine texts, I suspect we'd be in a very different place today, mm -hmm. sure. and our modern texts would not look as close to Westcott and Hort as they do. But one really, that's, that's a really important thing that happened in the intervening period between mm -hmm. Westcott and Hort and us, is the discovery of over 100 papyri, many of which, not all of which, but many of which confirm to scholars that the text in, say, Vaticanus or Sinaiticus is indeed early and, I would argue, good. But, um, but even if you don't argue that it's good, you still have, you cannot deny that it's early. Right. Do you see? Right. And so, Relatively early. Yes. Yeah, so if you want to blame somebody 
for the fact that our modern critical text looks so similar to Westcott and Horst, to me is a weird criticism. But if you do, <laughs> if you want to go that route and say they're so similar, that's bad. The pers the people to blame are the people that copied the papyri. Mm, right. <laughs> I would argue <laughs> at some level, because those papyri helped confirm the view that Sinaiticus and Vaticanus were very good manuscripts overall. So entirely so, independent of work that Hort, Westcott and Hort had done. I mean, nothing's entirely independent of them, but. <laughs> In the as, sense a, of like, as an influence yes, the papyri. In the sense it's not like anybody's just reading Westcott and Hort and saying, well, what text did they pick? Let's just pick the same one because they're Westcott and Hort. Right. No, that's not it, that's not it at all. Okay, okay, that's really helpful. Abaddon, thoughts there, agreement, disagreement? Yeah, I can see that. I mean, 1844, uh, Olive comes out and um, definitely took some time before um, it not, let me interrupt real quickly just to yeah, say, not, not comes out as in was produced then. No, 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 not so. people who no, claim no, that kind of idea. But no, it was discovered, right? Yeah, discovered. It, it was discovered, definitely, yeah, by Tischendorf. Um, but uh, slowly it made, it made its way into uh, text critical introductions. And of course, by the time uh, Westcott and Hoard write, this is understood, Olaf and B are the good manuscripts. Um, and then after that, I think. Most critical editions did maintain the same text, albeit the methodologies began to change and realized uh, they also saw the inconsistency, all the whole uh, Western non interpolations. You know, the, mm. it doesn't take long to go away. That, as good as that book is, that part didn't make any sense. It's <laughs> a little biased. Yeah, yeah, that that was, that's that's a really odd way of putting things, right? I think we mean the neutral text is wrong. <laughs> right. But let's call it Western non interpolation. <laughs> so things like that, I think. It didn't take long before people realized, okay, now that there's a mistake there, there's a problem there, there's a yeah. bias. And right. So, okay. So maybe a dropping of some ideas of a neutral text, Ho hopefully no <laughs> yeah. longer biased there. Yeah. What about, you mentioned yeah. a little bit earlier, and we've kind of mentioned it without saying his name, what about the idea of Aleutian recension? How, how key is that idea to a modern text? Because yeah. here's what happens a lot in some of the literature that we're talking about in some of these sessions. They'll claim modern Bibles are based on Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort was based on this idea of Aleutian recension. Here's evidence or lack of evidence that that ever took place. Therefore, we've disproved every Bible but the King James. It's not that simple, but that gets presented a lot. So tell, tell us a little Across bit about... Across the board, I mean, I don't know who holds to that other than certain people, but... You mean you hold to Aleutian recension? Yeah. 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 Metzger held to it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and Metzger never actually repented from that, but he was holding to Repented, the that's a strong word. <laughs> uh, the, the book well, to see on that is Klaus Wachtel's dissertation. That's the whole thesis of his dissertation was to disprove that claim mm -hmm. that the Byzantine text is the result of a concerted fourth century recension done mm -hmm. by Lucian. Yep. It, it, it is not a formal recension. Yeah, exactly. It's that right. simple. That not a and, but Metzger was trying to do what Westcott Hort did with their genealogical argument by arguing from the Lucianic recension to again come up with a reason for why the Byzantine text right. would have been a fourth century creation and not something pre-existing. Yeah. Right. Because in other words, to not have to deal with a whole chunk of manuscripts that they could kind of set aside yeah. as they were doing their own And you had the problem with Kurt Olland, too, mm -hmm. because Kurt Olland, when he originally started the Text und Textwert series, where he was going through a thousand test passages to determine which manuscripts were the most Byzantine so they could be eliminated from consideration, because Kurt Olland held the same view that if they're Byzantine, they're bad, so just eliminate them and we'll work only with the ones that are left. Mm. Well, a little, small caveat to that. He's trying to eliminate repetition, so he doesn't want to have to include all the Byzantine manuscripts. He wants to include representatives of it in order to identify which manuscripts can best represent the larger whole. He does the select test passages, right? Right. Yep. So he's not trying, in that work, he's not trying to eliminate the Byzantine text per se. But he does say elsewhere that he considered the Byzantine text of no value. Correct. He's not, mm -hmm. a, he's not a particular fan. But that, I think that's an important point of a big difference. So I think what happens is, I don't think many people really buy, um, maybe, maybe Metzger, I don't remember, but um, I don't think a ton of people necessarily buy Westcott and Hort's view that the Byzantine text is a result of a 4th century recension mm -hmm. done by Lucian. Right. Yeah. But you don't need to, to nevertheless come away with their same conclusion that the Byzantine text looks like, in places certainly, looks like a, a combination of, say, Western readings and Alexandrian readings, and therefore it's a descendant text type from the other two, and this is where their genealogical method is so important. Making that argument allows them to then eliminate the Byzantine text any time mm. it differs from the other two. Right. 
And that, I think, a lot of scholars did follow them in, even though they didn't necessarily need the Lucianic recension theory to do that. They, they nevertheless they took still the felt conflation that. theory, the right? Conflation, theory conflation as many still bought uh, and accepted that. it as yes. proof. And the trouble yes. is, the conflation also could be looked at from the opposite angle that if you may have a combined reading, and one of the ones Westcott Hort used was Luke 24, 53, they're continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Mm -hmm. Well, the possibility is also equally there because the Alexandrian text has one reading, praising, or, and the Western text has the blessing, and so therefore the Byzantine combined them. But it can be looked at from exactly the opposite the longer reading could be original. It actually fits Lucan stylistic practices where he joins two participles together. You have something very similar with the shepherds in Luke 2 that are returning back and they're praising and glorifying God too. Uh, so it could be the case that the longer reading, Byzantine reading in Luke 24, 53 was accidentally or even intentionally abridged by mm. either that what we call the Alexandrian scribes or the Western scribes to produce those elements by dropping one of the words. Right, right. Because otherwise it might be considered redundant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is an inter internal argument from intrinsic yeah, probability. It, it, it is. Can so, I add to this? What yes, said about yes. The so I think, you know, talking about I think it's important to note that a lot of people followed Westcott and Hort in their low opinion of the Byzantine text when it stands alone. Right. Okay. I think that's one of the most important changes in the last 20 years. Tell us about that change. Is that I think the, um, the editors of the Nestle Alon text now are, are actually much more willing to accept that the Byzantine text, when it stands alone from other manuscripts, earlier manuscripts, can still be correct. And I think that's a notable shift now. That does not mean the resulting text looks like Maurice Robinson's text at every point. It certainly doesn't. But, right. But it but should. It does look <laughs> but it more, should, obviously. Yeah, yeah. It looks more like it than Westcott and Hort did. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I've written about this in a number of places, but I think one of the biggest shifts that's happened in the discipline is that there is more willingness to accept uh, what we could call Byzantine readings, that is, readings found in only the later manuscripts. Mm -hmm. Uniquely Byzantine readings. Yeah, so you, something like uniquely Byzantine readings. There's more willingness, and I would include myself in this, more willingness to accept those readings as being original than there used to be. Even when I was a student, uh, so this was something that had, had to change for me in my dissertation mm. period. So like, I went into my dissertation with this sort of mentality of the Byzantine text is always wrong when it's by itself, and isn't that convenient? Because anytime it's by itself, I can move on. <laughs> it's actually quite you know, useful if true, but I became convinced that it's not true, mm. and that I should take a much closer look at Byzantine readings, so I'm, you know, on record as defending readings found in these later manuscripts, these later Byzantine manuscripts that are that don't have early support necessarily, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a real shift, uh, and it's important for people to know that that is a different from Westcott and Hort. Greater respect given to the Byzantine yep. talks, to not a wholesale yep. willingness not to follow it everywhere for everyone. Some, alone. some would. Yep. But among broad New Testament yep. textual criticism, yep. you'd say there's a greater respect today for yep. the Byzantine text form. So much so that the, the latest edition of the Didio Critica Maior that the Nestle Lon is now based on basically talks about uh, rejecting and reversing the unfair bias against the Byzantine text. Mm. That's not a Byzantine prioritist writing. No. That. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not a King James only. Yes. <laughs> right. These are modern... Uh, proponents of an eclectic method who are producing the standard uh, academic edition of the Bible of the New Testament, they are the ones saying, time to do away with this unfair bias against it. Okay, you clearly yeah. have something you want to chime well, in there with. Well, this is true I that sensed they it. have shift that, shifted that position, but in reality, the amount of shift, if we took it into percentage terms, is still a very minute amount. Uh, I don't know what the total number of Byzantine readings that have been accepted from the Catholic epistles, from the Book of Acts, and from mm -hmm. Mark up to this point has been, but we're talking maybe less than 100. Yeah, but it, yeah, so. but if I can put it in different terms, places where they've changed their mind from the Nestle Alon, say, 27, a very good chunk, and I, I don't know the number offhand, but I want to say somewhere in the range of 50% of the changes they've made have been in favor of a Byzantine reading. Mm -hmm. So it tells you when they have been willing to change their mind, yeah. the Byzantine text is clearly having a bigger effect. They just need to increase okay. the percentage. <laughs> right. saying, Raise like, those so numbers. They're never going to, they're never going to satisfy Maurice because he wants the Byzantine text at every place. <laughs> right. Right. They but, are never going to approve so uh, 
a reason eclectic today or someone using CBGM is never going to come to a Byzantine text conclusion. Right. Sure. Uh, this is just a given based on their own presuppositions. Sure. That's fair. And my presuppositions nat naturally must yeah. differ. That's fair. Well, I, I appreciate that disagreement. I appreciate the, the crosstalk. Uh, before we wrap up, does anyone have anything else that they want to just kind of jump in and add about this idea of modern textual criticism and the impact of Westcott and Hort on it? And then maybe I want to ask a question about the English Revised Version. Oh, okay. And the impact I was, there. That's what I was going to talk about. If, so, if somebody uh, else yeah. doesn't have anything else they want to jump in. Please. Well, I'll jump in on just on the one thing there that you do have reasoned eclectic textual critics who have been complaining over the last 50 years that the resultant text still does resemble Westcott Hort much mm. more than it resembles anything else. This would include Caldwell, it includes mm. Epp, mm -hmm. it includes uh, uh, even Kurt Olland. Mm -hmm. uh, there's others that have said all this, and uh, the question that was asked, even Kenneth Clark said the same thing, but the question someone of them asked was, how much progress have we really made in the text if we still resemble Westcott Hort that much? And I think Clark and Caldwell did put the finger on what it was. We can't do textual criticism until we get a good history of the text as the basis for it. And right. if you don't have the history of the text, this is why Epp said eclecticism is temporary, it's a holding process, it's not supposed to be the be-all and end-all to solve the problems. It's We just need that history of the text. and. Each side has to decide a historical model to work from. Mm -hmm. The Byzantine text has a historical model. Yeah. Whether or not some people think that it's not all there and spelled out. Right, and, and maybe Jerry. not in every case yet demonstrated by yeah. internal evidence, but, but you're working on it and you're we, gonna finish. But we do have a history of the text that underlies our methodology. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. I would say, you know, the difference between some, me and Maurice is not that we think the history of the text is, he thinks it's important, I think it's not important. Right, right. It's actually that we just have different histories of the text that we are working from. Right. Uh, I think that's the difference. And it's fair that some of that may be provisional as we're working. I mean, pastors have to wrestle with textual variants as they're preaching. The field has to press forward. Maybe we don't have a perfectly reconstructed history of the text, but we've got to do something with what we've been given. You look like you wanted to chime in there. I was just going to say one thing that needs to be mentioned is, is the attempt to do away with text types. Mm. Like they're, sure. they're passe, they're done, we need to move on. I think it's way too early to say that. Okay. And I feel like um, the text types are still here and still mm. valuable. Uh, even with the CBGM methodology, I know that's uh, some of the things maybe you could address that the text types are not going to matter, but, mm. but isn't it true that um, the initial um, data that is fed in is based on text times. I want to hear your response here because you're doing a paper on the future of text times, right? right? Yes. Yeah. How much do you want me to say? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're going to take forever to give I us just set it up for you. Okay, okay, okay. He's, he's put the ball right in front of me. Now take the bat and swing it real quickly. Go for it. Come on, what I said. No, no, so I think... Um, I think Abaddon's right there's, that there's ferment about this question of text types. And I, in my opinion, a big part of it is what we mean by the term. Sure. So Eldon Epp has argued that hey, okay, if we don't want to agree to text types, fine, let's talk about textual clusters. clusters. Yeah. And in my opinion, his definition of textual clusters is not really anything different. He's just put a new label on the same thing. Sure. So I'm like, I don't think that's really a solution. Um, but what is the problem? Why do people think there is a problem? The basic issue is how do you draw boundaries between them? So I could show you, for example, in the Catholic letters where Codex Sinaiticus agrees as much when you take all the data from the Edito Critico Maior into view, that Codex Sinaiticus agrees as much with a manuscript like 35, which is considered Byzantine, as it does with Vaticanus. Well, if that's the case, then why are you grouping Vaticanus and Sinaiticus together as a text type, mm, as part right. of a text type, rather than drawing the boundary differently and putting Sinaiticus with 35? Now, some would respond to that by saying, well, the problem is that the Didio Critica Maior data is taking too much data into account. It's counting everything, even a, you know, agreement in a chi, uh, the word and, even an agreement in you know, an article, a Greek article, and we should not use those kind of agreements to decide text types. So I think the, the 
problem with text types is a problem of definition. Nobody actually agrees on what they're talking about. Right. So when one person says, I still think text types are legitimate, fine, but what do you mean by that? Somebody else can say, I don't think they're legitimate because they're conceiving them differently. Does that make sense? Yeah, so absolutely. I do think the matter of definition is about half the battle here. Okay. <laughs> and then the second half of the battle is, okay, given a definition, what do you actually want to use them for? And that's right. why I think Westcott and Hort wanted to use them to do genealogy. Right. They wanted to create these three distinct things, text types, and then relate them genealogically. I, for example, am not convinced that text types are so well-defined that we should be relating them in that way. Right. That's my view. But I think that's where the ferment is right now. Yeah, is yeah. What are they? What are we going to use them for? What are they helpful for? What aren't they helpful for? Right. And depending on how you answer those questions is going to affect a lot whether you think they're still a helpful category or not. Okay. Well, that's a helpful summary. I know it's a complex mm -hmm. issue, lots of different views on it, lots of talk about it, yes. but thank you for kind of summarizing it for us. We're going to shift gears real quick just before we come to an end, uh, and we are almost closed. I appreciate you guys hanging with us for what's been kind of a lengthy session, and I appreciate our viewers hanging with us, and I'm grateful. But I do want to ask a few questions about uh, Westcott and Hort's impact specifically on the English Revised Version, because for most yeah. listeners, they're not picking up a Greek New Testament text, right. uh, at least for most of our listeners, they're not picking up a Greek New Testament text. They've got an English Bible in their hand, right. and they're concerned with the history of English Bible translation, right. and they want to know, as we think about kind of this broader argument, how much did Westcott and Hort have to do with the English Bible in my hand? So maybe, Peter, since you've done some work there, sure. point us towards the impact that they had on the English Revised Version yeah. and the later history of English Bible translation. Okay, so in brief, the English Revised Version is the, is the first and really the only official revision of the King James Bible, so it's kind of a big deal. Um, it's the result of about 10 years of work by a group of scholars who came together that included Westcott, Hort, Scrivener, and some others, okay? A number of others. And... Uh, it was a big, big deal when it came out. Uh, for example, they telegraphed the entire New Testament across the Atlantic to publish it in New York. They telegraphed it then from New York to Chicago. The Chicago Tribune published the entire thing as a special insert mm. in May of 1881. So it was like a big deal. And they sold yeah. hundreds of thousands of copies of this newspaper. because everybody, Yeah, everybody wanted to see what is different. And a lot of things were different. Something like 5,000 differences between the King James and the Revised Version. And the reason why Westcott and Hort get attached to that so closely is because they were on the revision committee, but also because a lot of people, even from the very beginning, assumed wrongly that the revised version was a translation of their Greek New Testament. Mm. And it was not. Now, the reason people think that is because they did. They published early editions of the Greek New Testament in the years leading up to the final publication. And their, their Greek New Testament was published in the same year as the Revised right. Version. So it's easy to conflate the two. And again, they'd been publishing these early drafts and sending them to the Revision Committee throughout right. the 10 years the Revision Committee was doing its work. But I'll, let me just give you some numbers that really helped clarify this for me, because mm -hmm. I thought, oh yeah, but they're probably the same. Well, they're not necessarily. So, for example, given over 5,000 changes to the Textus Receptus, Westcott and Hort's text's particular influence on the Revised Version is very, very small. I'll just yeah. give you one stat from Matthew. This is in, uh, can I hold this up? Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Adam, is it Adam? Yeah, oh, Alan, sorry. Alan. Alan Cadwallader has the details in his, I think his fourth chapter, and he says there are uh, 66 places in Matthew's Gospel where Westcott and Hort had a unique reading relative to the other editions available at the time. Meaning they alone supported this yep. reading as opposed yep. to the other so printed So Tischendorf didn't have the, their reading, Tregellis didn't have it, okay. And none of those 66 unique readings in Westcott and Hort make it into the Revised Version. Mm, wow. None of them. So their distinctive influence on the Revised Version was very, very minimal. Yeah. But people associated the two in their mind right from the start. And this actually annoyed both Westcott and Hort mm -hmm. uh, from the get-go. They were actually worried about this. One of the reasons why they got their Greek New Testament out when they did is because Hort was really, really afraid this was going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> And he actually thought their Greek New Testament was going to come out after the Revised Version, and the people would think they based their work on the Revised Version, and right. that had not happened. What ended up happening is the reverse. Right. People thought the Revised Version was based entirely on their work, and that also was not true. And that also annoyed him, uh, both him and, and Westcott, but especially Hort, I think. Yeah. And um, so they were very adamant in their own time that, no, the Revised Version was not based on their Greek New Testament. Yes, the Revision Committee had their text in an earlier form, to work with, but they did not slavishly follow it. Scrivener was there to give his opinion, and they had other editions like Tregellis to look at right. and Tischendorf. There was no reason why that committee needed to just follow Westcott and Hort all the yeah. time. 
And those editions had come before them, were influenced that's by their work. That's it. And their uh, edition wasn't even out. Right. So, you know, little it would pieces not have of been it hard, being given to Yeah, people. it would not have been hard for the committee to say, we don't need to follow this. You yeah. Know. And, and they did make changes from their, these early editions they published privately. They did change their mind between those in 1881. Right. So, okay. So, yeah, I think actually that's one of the great myths. I think it's one of the reasons why Westcott and Hort stand out so much in people's mind as somebody mm. to either praise or blame. Mm. And on both sides. of the King James. Yeah. Is because they see their Greek text as the one that led to the revised version. And the revised version was the first big revision of the King James that led to all these other ones. And so if you want to get back to the headwaters of the stream... Westcott and Hort are your problem. Right. But in fact, the Greek text that is the basis for the revised version is not that much, does not owe that much to them. That's really helpful and a helpful summary. I think from my perspective, and maybe you guys would disagree, but I would actually blame one person in, in particular for that particular <laughs> myth. And I love Dean John Bergen. I love uh, his passion for the Bible. I love his defensive inspiration. I know you would support a lot of his method. But he did, in the three articles that he wrote for the Quarterly Review, essentially claim that Westcott and Hort had controlled the revision committee mm -hmm. and that their text had been translated. Yeah. And the head of that committee, Bishop Ellicott, yeah. responded and said, actually, I've counted, yeah. and the number of places where we followed Westcott Hort when they were a sole witness yeah. through the whole New Testament was 64. Right. Out of 5,000. Out of 5,000 changes. From the TR. Yeah. So that's like tiny speck yeah. of distinct influence. Now... People can still argue, oh yeah, but their influence is there in other ways. Sure. Again, we're talking if we're talking about their distinctive influence, there is no reason at all statistically to see Westcott and Hort's edition as especially to blame. Why not blame Tregellis right. or Tischendorf? Right. These two should get as much of the blame as Westcott and Hort get. But again, because of the publication date and the fact that they're on the committee, the two have been fused in a lot of people's yeah. minds right from the beginning. But wrongly so. Yeah, and I would say some writings that continue to be published that, sure, that yes. unfortunately yeah, spread those myths. Sure. Well, that, that is super helpful, guys. I am super grateful for each of you being here. I know you've taken a big chunk of your time to talk to us. We at the Textual Confidence Collective are grateful for your time, grateful for your, for your expertise, and especially grateful for your pastoral love for the church to have a confident trust in Scripture and to stay away from what we think are dangerous extremes in our view of the Bible and promote what we call textual confidence. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you for lending your voices to this conversation. You're welcome. Thank you. It's me again. I think this discussion demonstrated that Westcott and Hort do not control the modern practice of New Testament textual criticism. Of course, we had two Byzantine prioritists on this panel, Dr. Robinson and Dr. Shaw. They're certainly not controlled by Westcott and Hort. You heard my friend Peter Gurry say that their story of the history of the New Testament text, that is of Westcott and Hort, has not continued to be persuasive. And note one other small thing. You can take a Byzantine priority position and not be a King James onlyist. You can be the leading proponent of the leading scholarly alternative to the critical text. That would be Maurice Robinson. And yet not use the Textus Receptus. All three of our guests for this first episode of the second series of the Textual Confidence Collective, all three of them reject the textual absolutism found commonly among King James and TR defenders. You'll hear more about this from Maurice Robinson in a future video that's not actually part of this TCC series. Just hang on for that. But I hope you'll stay tuned for the three following videos in this second series of the Textual Confidence Collective because we'll dive into the charges commonly and slanderously made against Westcott and Hort, and we will uncover the truth about what these 19th century men really believed.